Welcome to the QSIM Learning Module, Teaching Patient-Centered Care Using Narrative and Reflective Pedagogies. We've been using these pedagogies in our courses for some time now, and have found they provide important avenues through which to explore and promote patient-centered care in both undergraduate and graduate courses. We will situate our presentation specifically in the practices of attending, listening, and being present in practice. These practices are crucial for providing patient-centered care, and yet they're not easily taught using more traditional approaches like lecture or discussion groups. For instance, it's safe to say that most students know that it's important to listen to patients for whom they care. Yet, how do they develop this ability? How would we, as teachers, know if our students weren't doing well listening to patients? Do patients in their care feel listened to? We all experience time when someone's listening but not really hearing what we're saying because they aren't really present. In other words, as nurses, we know there's a difference between merely interacting with patients or interacting with our colleagues and connecting with them. Yet, how often do we talk to students about these practices or assist them to improve their abilities in these areas? In this module, we'll explore current teaching practices that enable or perhaps inhibit these abilities and will persistently ask you to join us in considering many questions like how well are our students being prepared to provide patient-centered care in which listening, attending, and being present in practice are central. Again, it's easy for us to assume that our students are learning to provide patient-centered care because we stress this frequently in both classroom and clinical courses and students routinely provide us with subjective data. Yet looking at the knowledge, skills, and attitude statements on the CUSIN website related to patient-centered care, it becomes apparent that the competency recognizing the patient and family as a source of control and full partner, or attitudes like respecting patients' preferences, values, and needs, require more than knowledge about this competency, or even the ability to apply this knowledge in a clinical situation. Rather, providing patient-centered care is a complex practice that requires attending, listening, and being present to the patient and family. For instance, how well can students see healthcare situations through the patient's eyes, or respect and encourage individual expression of patient values, preferences, or express needs? Narrative and reflective pedagogies can be helpful in fostering these abilities. When we use the term pedagogy in this module, we are not talking merely about strategies, but also ways of seeing and thinking about the discipline, the nature of knowledge, the materials we use, how and when we use them, the interactions among faculty, students, clinicians, patients, and families, the attitudes we convey. One of the problems with exploring new pedagogies for nursing education is that we're so familiar with conventional pedagogy and how innovation occurs within this approach that we don't recognize opportunities to transform our courses by fostering a different kind of thinking using different pedagogies. For example, in conventional pedagogy, also called outcomes or competency-based education, teachers commonly assume that learning is defined as a change in behavior that's readily observed and that can be measured and evaluated. Using narrative and reflective pedagogies, we're shifting our attention to also consider those practices that aren't readily observed and hence can often be overlooked, and students' proficiency is merely assumed. Throughout this module, we invite you to think about how these pedagogies can help us think about the practices of attending, listening, and being with, and how this enhances students' abilities to provide patient-centered care. Just like us, our students are most at home in conventional pedagogies, too, in which the teacher provides information, be that content, knowledge, or skill demonstrations, that they must then try to memorize and apply as needed. So adopting a narrative or reflective pedagogy requires that we talk to students about the shift we're making and why we're making it. We often talk to students about how attending, listening, and being present will be emphasized in this class as a way to enhance these clinical abilities. We also spend time talking with students about the rules of engagement, so to speak, or the kind of environment that we will co-create in this course. Talking specifically about the rules of engagement reminds us all of the shared responsibility for the learning environment. As faculty, we often feel so responsible for creating a productive learning environment 
that we design all the details of the course in advance for our students. However, if we practice letting the students identify and design their learning, we can actually sustain and facilitate their learning via letting go of our tight control of the learning process. By doing so, students are encouraged to draw on their existing knowledge, ask questions, and identify learning needs in relationship to their practice. When using narrative or reflective pedagogies, this is achieved through both group and individual learning activities. Our role becomes checking in from time to time, asking questions, and encouraging students to explore multiple perspectives and articulate opposing points of view. In essence, when using narrative or reflective pedagogies, students become our pedagogical partners as we all explore and learn more about how we can provide patient-centered care. Let's look first at narrative pedagogy. Narrative pedagogy is a phenomenological pedagogy developed by Dr. Nancy Dippelman at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. It's the first pedagogy developed from nursing research for nursing education and practice. This is important because this means that the context in which nursing is learned and practiced is front and center in this pedagogy. It reflects how teaching and learning nursing are actually experienced and the challenges teachers and students face in learning a complex practice such as nursing. The emphasis in narrative pedagogy is on understanding the meaning and significance of our practice experiences. For instance, what does it mean to give patient-centered care? What does it mean to patients to be listened to or not? What does it mean to be present to a patient? Also, when enacting narrative pedagogy, teachers and students consistently think together about new possibilities for practice and for teaching and learning, moving beyond critique or problem solving to also consider what is possible in our courses and schools. Narrative pedagogy occurs when teachers and students attend to how the concerned practices are enacted, publicly share and interpret stories of their experiences in nursing education and practice and collectively envision new possibilities. Central to narrative pedagogy is a commitment to creating new partnerships and caring communities within schools of nursing that overcome teacher-centered approaches to education. When teachers and students publicly share and interpret their experiences, what's working and what's not working well in their schools become apparent, and new possibilities can collectively be explored and considered. That is, narrative pedagogy holds open and problematic our shared practices of learning that creates an openness for the possibility of anything to emerge and a future of new possibilities for nursing education and practice. Again, narrative pedagogy emerges as teachers and students gather to hear and interpret each other's stories using the concernful practices, creating dialogue that is reflective, reflexive, and focused on community practices. As teachers and students publicly reflect on and share stories of their experiences in nursing education, they're made mindful of times of connecting, of getting through and making a difference in patients or in each other's lives, and of times of breakdown when nothing went right. As students and teachers consider times of connecting and times of breakdown, they can identify ways they can collectively improve their practice and their schools. Let's spend a moment looking at the concernful practices of schooling, learning, and teaching. During the course of Dickelman's research, she used hermeneutic phenomenology to analyze the experiences of teachers and students in nursing. As you know, part of this research method is identifying recurring themes and patterns that reflect common experiences and shared meanings of nursing education. Dickelman named these common experiences the concernful practices of schooling, of note here is that the emphasis is on practices rather than strategies, curriculum, or instruction. As practices, the concernful practices describe ways teachers and students experience nursing education by highlighting aspects that are so familiar they are often overlooked. As such, the concernful practices are not a particular method or strategy for classroom instruction, but rather describe how teachers and students experience teaching and learning. For instance, Teachers often devote a great deal of time and energy to welcoming students into a course. Getting off to a good start, setting the tone, establishing rapport are common ways teachers describe how they welcome students in a way that calls forth learning. Similarly, 
Students welcome teachers in the way they become interested in, take seriously, or participate in class. Thus, welcoming, gathering, and calling forth describes how teachers and students as a learning community come together for learning. The concernful practices, however, in and of themselves are neutral. For example, just as teachers can welcome students in ways that call out the best in them, they can also welcome students in ways that are oppressive and confrontational, calling out the worst in students. What matters is how these practices are enacted. By providing a new language for describing these experiences, the concernful practices encourage teachers and students to explore the meanings and significances of their experiences and to think about these experiences in new ways and from multiple perspectives. When teachers and students attend to how the concernful practices are showing up in their schools, narrative pedagogy is enacted. Let's look at an example. This story was shared by a pre-licensure nursing student during the course of a study investigating students' experiences of making a difference to patients and their families in their clinical courses. This student wrote, When I was first given my assignment, a couple of nurses told me my clinical instructor must hate me because Edith was a frequent flyer at that hospital and she was a major pain in the gluteus maximus. Her current admission was because the nursing home she lived at had stopped giving her a prescribed antibiotic. Of course, I brushed off their negative comments because I believe in going into a room and meeting a patient with an open mind. So the next day, I got gowned up in that ever-so-fashionable isolation attire and did just that. Well, Edith was a needy patient, but she had every right to be. She had a lot going on with her, and the doctors were trying to find out what exactly all that was. I did my best to make Edith as comfortable as possible. She liked everything just a certain way, so I tried my best to do that. Unfortunately, Edith had to have a central line placed that day because the pick line that was placed in her right arm a day earlier had caused her arm to blow up and resemble that of a Popeye arm. Edith wanted me to stay with her during the procedure and hold her hand. Edith was in great pain during the procedure, and I did my best to comfort her by holding her other hand and rubbing it gently. After a little over an hour of comforting Edith and telling her how strong she was during numerous unsuccessful attempts at placing a central line, the next doctor had arrived and was successful in placing the central line in the left side. After all that fun and excitement, Edith had to go down to the GI lab. Let me just say, I can't stand the GI lab. I hate it. If there were personal hells that looked like the place in your life you hated most, mine would be the GI lab, and all day long I would get it to hear gagging and moaning while things got shoved up and down places they shouldn't be going. Anyways, Edith was going for another exam. I comforted Edith that she was being transferred to the gurney to be taken to the GI lab. Then she looked me right in the eyes and asked me in the littlest voice if I was going to go with her. Despite my pure hatred for the GI lab, I told Edith of course I would if she wanted me to, and I just had to clear it with my instructor. Much to my delight, I was given permission to go to the GI lab. Edith kept thanking me. Upon arrival to the GI lab, the room Edith was supposed to have her procedure in was being used. I waited with her for an hour and a half. The time I was supposed to leave clinical had come and gone, and I was still by Edith's side. After another half hour, they were ready for Edith. I went with her into the room and said my goodbyes before the procedure started. Then she asked in that little voice if I was going to stay with her during it. My heart was breaking. I'm a sucker for that little voice. The doctor said she would be happy if I stayed. So I told Edith that yes, I would stay with her. It's a great story, isn't it? I'm sure many of you have heard very similar stories from your students who are learning clinical practice and dealing with very complex patients as they learn to provide patient-centered care. But using this story as the context for our considerations about narrative pedagogy, we remember that we begin using narrative pedagogy by attending to the concernful practices. So thinking back to this account, can you identify the concernful practices that are in this story? You might pause the presentation and consider this further. As you think about the concernful practices you identified, what do you find meaningful? interesting, perhaps thought-provoking, 
about how these practices show up in this context. Ask yourself, where and how do students in my course, in our program, learn these practices? What things create that opportunity? What's getting in the way of students having these kinds of experiences? You might also consider, if this story was shared by one of my students, say during post-clinical conference, what questions might I ask to engage all of the students in thinking further about these practices? Again, feel free to pause the presentation and give some thought to crafting some questions that you might, might throw out to students in response to this story. Now, of course, as you look at the questions that you've crafted, what becomes apparent is that these might be, look very different from the kinds of questions you usually ask. The concernful practices draw our attention to different aspects of the accounts we commonly hear. What does this mean to you as a teacher? What if any aspects of this account became apparent because you identified them using the concernful practices? Again, feel free to pause the presentation or to review the story again to give it additional thought. Here's the citation for the article in which this story first appeared. I invite you to check it out and see how this story was explicated using the concernful practices and the implications these have for nursing education. Next, we'll turn our attention to reflective pedagogy and how fostering reflective practice in our courses can further assist students to develop their abilities to provide patient-centered care. Reflection is a learning tool that grew out of the limitations of knowledge derived from technical rationality and research knowledge alone. Schoen argued that practitioners face difficulties in using this knowledge because it is generated in situations that are context-free. As a rule, practitioners make decisions based on the context of the practice situation and their experience. Reflective practice allows nursing students to access and build upon their clinical experience and emerging knowledge. Through this form of intentional practice, students can become more fully aware of issues such as safety. They learn to think more about creating a safe environment for their patient, other patients, and staff, as well as the ways in which their practice contributes to this. Definitions of reflection are characterized as learning through experience toward gaining new insights or changed perceptions of self and practice. If students share clinical practice stories or narratives, the impact on patient care is illuminated. Numerous frameworks have been developed for facilitating reflection. The Gibbs Reflective Cycle takes the nurse through six stages. At each stage, the nurse considers a question or cue to help them reflect on the experience. Because the cues are broad, this model can be applied to clinical situations with patients or in professional interactions with others. The Boyd and Fails model is similar to the Gibbs in that they both conclude with deliberate consideration of whether or not to act on the reflective process. However, Boyd and Fails and Mesero models do not ask questions but present stages or levels of reflection which can be observed by others or through one's own reflection on practice. Further, Mesro's work examines the depth of reflection through a number of processes spanning from consciousness to critical consciousness. Stage and cyclical models may be particularly useful with novice nurses to grasp the essence of reflection. However, since reflection often does not occur in an orderly step-by-step -step fashion, John's model for structured reflection offers the nurse a way to access reflection in a non-prescriptive way, thus moving away from the idea that reflection is a technical or linear task and emphasizing using the model creatively to guide the self within the context of an experience. It offers cues to access the depth and breadth of reflection necessary for learning through experience. These four models are not an exclusive list, and other models exist, which may have value for nursing faculty and students. Let's look at a second example. This story was adapted from a learning activity, which I asked the nursing students to reflect on an experience they had had with another healthcare professional around an area of concern that demonstrated thoughtful consideration of their perspective as well as that of the other. 
students were asked to consider the following questions in writing their story. How did you convey your presence to the other person? What were your thoughts, feelings, and behaviors during the interaction? How did you use your unique gifts and talents to work through the situation? What were your specific responses? And how did they promote resolution for both you and the other person? And finally, what can you take away from this situation as a guide for future encounters? Story two. Not long ago, Lisa began the day shift in the ICU with a coworker named Ron. The morning had gone well. Mid-afternoon, Ron received a direct admit patient with chest pain. A group of staff gathered to take vital signs, hook up the monitor, and assess the patient. Ron stayed in the room to do his admission assessment. Lisa glanced at the monitor and gasped. Heart rate of 175 with huge rapid ears. Acute MI. Lisa immediately called for an EKG and started O2 and IV and drew a rainbow of blood tubes. Ron was furious, grabbed Lisa's elbow forcibly, and took Lisa out of the room. Ron told Lisa she had undermined his authority with his patient. The accusatory conversation erupted several times before and after the patient left for the cardiac cath lab. Lisa took a short break, shaking from stress and disbelief over what had just happened. She could not understand how Ron could be focused on being undermined when the patient and teamwork must come first. She calmed herself in the break room, determined not to let the tension continue. She asked Ron if they could discuss what had happened. He agreed. They walked into a private space, and Lisa said she wanted to understand where Ron was coming from. She repeated what she heard him telling her. She actively tried to project feelings of calm and made her tone of voice non-defensive. She described her experience to Ron and the emotions that she felt during the incident. Lisa explained to Ron that she respected him as a nurse and wanted to know what they could have done better. Ron calmed down and admitted that he felt embarrassed that he had not caught the MI and realized he acted defensively and not in the best interest of the patient. Later, Lisa reported that by actively reflecting on the situation that occurred and recognizing her goal to improve communication and lessen the resulting tension, she was able to dialogue with Ron from a place of care and concern. She learned that by being calm and using a non-accusatory tone of voice, she was able to have a successful resolution to the situation. Ron and Lisa both identified a goal of not repeating this kind of situation. They agreed to meet again to talk about strategies that would promote good communication in the unit. Lisa's story illuminates a reflective process. For example, if we apply Boyd and Fail's stages of reflection, can you identify the sense of discomfort that arose within Lisa, within Ron? How did each share their concern? Was there new information shared? How did Ron and Lisa demonstrate openness? How did this influence the situation? How was resolution reached? You might also consider if the story was shared by one of your students what questions might you ask to engage students to think about establishing a sense of continuity? And how might the outcome influence practice in the future? Now consider our typical ways of responding to such accounts. What aspects become apparent because of your attention to the reflective process? How might this deliberative approach influence your teaching, particularly as it relates to the cues and competencies of patient-centered care or teamwork and collaboration. Narrative and reflective approaches to learning are symbiotic with patient-centered approaches to care. They involve learning together and encourage genuine appreciation and mutual respect demonstrated through listening, attending, and being present. They support collaboration, open communication, and positive risk management, which are factors that create a culture of safety. Finally, they promote the development of self-awareness, as well as relationship and leadership skills. For more on this approach, the Horton Deutsch and Sherwood Manuscript examine reflection as a learning strategy and look at theories of reflection and methods for application to nursing. One of the practices being widely adopted in quality improvement work is rapid cycle change. Asking ourselves questions like, 
Given what I've learned in this module, what's one thing I could change in my teaching practice by next Tuesday to foster attending, listening, and being present helps us keep momentum for our improvement work. As you reflect on what you've heard in these, this module, some of you may be thinking about big, sweeping changes in your courses. Others may be thinking about smaller, more focused changes. We invite you to give it a try, and then consider sharing what you've developed or what you currently do via the QSIM website. Here's an example of how you can easily create a focused classroom experience to engage students in thinking about patient-centered care and the practices of listening, attending, and being present. First, have students group themselves into pairs and within each pair to determine who will be the speaker and who will be the listener. When this has been decided, the speaker is instructed to spend five minutes telling the listener about the characteristics they've inherited from their family that most influence their nursing practice. The listener is instructed not to talk or respond to the speaker with any kind of utterance or sound. They may maintain eye contact or may not, those kinds of things, but they may not speak. Your responsibility during this exercise is to time the experience so that it lasts the full five minutes. Begin the experience and call time when the five minutes has elapsed. After the five minutes has elapsed, engage the whole group of students in considering the meaning and significance of their experience. First, you might ask the speakers to debrief with the large group about the experience that they just had. What was it like for them to be listened to for this amount of time without interruption? In most cases, it's quite an amazing experience for them. Next, ask the listeners to debrief. What was it like for them to just listen for an extended period of time? What did they learn about themselves and their practice from having to listen for five minutes without interrupting the speaker? Then you might have the speakers and listeners, the group together, explore what they've learned about listening. What can they take away from this experience to inform their practice and their ability to provide patients in what new insights do they have about listening and its importance in terms of patient-centered care? Of course, this exercise could also be used in a clinical course, whether it's in acute care or in a community setting. By engaging students in starting each clinical shift, spending five uninterrupted minutes listening to their assigned patients. Again, timing is important. We often think we listen for a long time, and yet research shows that healthcare providers often interrupt and ask questions. That is, we focus on gleaning specific information rather than attending to what the patients want to tell us. This citation is an article that was published in the special issue of Journal of Nursing Education that was focused on quality and safety, and it provides a great example of how this, ex this listening experience can be incorporated into a clinical In summary, we believe that narrative and reflective pedagogies are important for teaching about quality and safety in general, and patient-centered care specifically. These pedagogies help us engage students in thinking about the tacit aspects of practice that are so easily overlooked in courses filled with content. But as you've seen in this module, the contributions of narrative and reflective pedagogies can hear and use them to teach patient-centered care in your courses, and that you'll share some of the activities you create with others via the QSIM website. In closing, we want to share with you a quote from Chris Johns, a pioneer in reflective pedagogy that we believe says it all about the importance of using narrative and reflective pedagogies to create experiences that help students appreciate the practices of listening, attending, and being with as they learn to provide patient-centered Being mindful is fundamental to wisdom, the ability to make best judgments about situations by seeing the big picture for what it is. Within the complex and often indeterminate world of clinical practice, the ability to make good judgments will seem most significant, together with a deep compassion for the experience of the patient. 